It is my understanding that I am talking to the leaders of the church. And because of that, I take it very seriously because I know that what happens here will affect what happens in the church. And by church, I mean the life of the people God has entrusted to us. If your soul matters, if your salvation matters to you, if the salvation of the people God has entrusted to you matter, if your calling as a servant by God matters, then this message or this series of messages is for you. I was told that the theme is called to serve. Can we say that together? One more time. The first message will be a foundation. I hope you will be shaken for the better. This is the latest message I got from God. It's very challenging even to preach or to share. And I believe also challenging to hear. But I know that God's Spirit is with us and that He will help us to understand. What is the theme? Called to serve. Called to serve. How do you normally think about yourself? You know, as human beings, unless you are not a human being, we talk to ourselves a lot. We talk to others, but most of the time, we talk to ourselves. There is something in our minds that happens over and over again, every day, every night, all the time. We talk to ourselves about ourselves. So the question is, how do you normally feel about yourself? And by normally, I mean every day. But also I want you to think about the time when you are told that you'll be the elder or the deacon or the Sabbath school. What came in your mind? Most of the time, this is what people tell themselves. I feel so odd. I feel so broken. Every day, elder, people think like that about themselves. I feel so unfulfilled. I feel so inadequate. I feel so unqualified. I feel so unequipped, unprepared. I feel so out of place. I feel so empty inside. I feel I don't belong. I feel like something is missing in me. I feel like the pieces of my life do not add up together nicely. Anybody who talks to himself or herself like that every day? Did you think like that when they told you your responsibility? And these things shape us. They make us who we are. And sometimes we don't realize how far and how deep these things go. There are some people who cannot look at themselves in the mirror and feel comfortable. There are some people who cannot look at themselves in the mirror and tell to themselves, I love you. Because they feel odd, they feel bad about themselves. Well, 
This leads to what I call unconnectedness. It looks like somewhere within us there is no connection. But also incompleteness. It's like something is empty within us. You know, if you remember the first slide, there was a picture. What was on the picture? There was a plant that was growing. That plant was at first a seed. But a seed by itself cannot grow. The seed needs soil. It needs a certain environment. So it is not about only what happens what or what is within the seed. It is also about what happens around the seed. So this unconnectedness, unfulfillment produces a mismatch. Meaning, we don't feel comfortable in our environment. We feel odd at church. We feel inadequate with our office mates. In our own family, sometimes we are the only Christian or the only Adventist and we feel odd. We feel we don't belong. We go to a place, we feel we are odd. In school, for those who are students, you are the only person who doesn't go to school on Saturday. You feel odd. And sometimes even because of other people's qualifications, we feel so low. And we don't relate properly to the environment because something within us is unconnected and then we end up experiencing unfulfillment. Believe me, the history of the church is full of people who served God with empty hearts. And they don't feel that sense of fulfillment. You see, sometimes we are here, Sabbath after Sabbath, we study the Sabbath school lesson, but we don't feel fulfilled. Hello? We attend church service. We serve him as elders, as pastors, as deacons. We do everything correct, but still, we feel that we don't belong. We are not fulfilled. And I was wondering, what's the problem? You know, there is a sickness called clumsiness. Clumsiness, people who are clumsy, fall by themselves. They cannot stand and without falling. They just fall. They don't need anyone to push them. And they fall because they don't function very well in their environment because something within them is broken. So that's a picture of somebody who is clumsy. He's alone, nobody is doing anything to him, but he's already falling and everything is apart. Everything is clumsy, unconnected. He doesn't fit, he doesn't belong. The environment is a threat to him and he's a threat to, him, to the environment. And I realize that clumsiness in heart and life is an outward symptom of a deeper sickness. Our theme is called to serve. I was watching a video last week online. It's an African American who is a Christian and a comedian. They do that over there. And one night, he was talking to the audience, just as I am doing now, thousands of people. And he was trying to tell them something very simple in life. So what he did, he showed another video to explain what he wanted them to explain. And the video was about another session that he had in another place. So what happened in that second video was that, he was sitting in front of a different audience and what he normally does is that he will pick any person 
and start engaging the person in a conversation without talking to the person before. And things always happen, that's his gift. So that day he picked another African American in the crowd and he said, what is your, who are you? I'm so, so and so, what is your job? What do you live for? He said, I am a musician. And then the comedian asked him in front of everybody, can you sing Amazing Grace? And he started singing Amazing Grace, a very nicely beautiful voice, just like Sister Anne, very beautiful. And people were amazed and they were wondering, wow, this man can sing. He was singing tenor very nicely. When he was done, the same comedian asked him, he said, I want you to sing the same song, but now I want you to think that before you sing, you just got shot and somebody in your family is in a drama. Sing again. Oh, you need to hear that second song. He would sing with all his soul the second time. And everybody was touched. People started standing and clapping and saying, Amen, Hallelujah, in the hall. And that comedian told the people, the first time he sung what he knew. But the second time he sung why. And the why made the what more important, more interesting. So as we think about our clumsiness, our inadequateness, unpreparedness, we are all, we don't feel we belong. The question is not how I feel about myself or what is happening to me. The big question is, What's the big question? Why am I like this? Why do I talk to myself like that? Why do I think of myself like this? Why can't I love myself? Because Christ said you shall love the Lord, the God, love your neighbor as yourself. And some of us don't know how to do that. How come we feel like that? Why is it so? There is only one reason that has two aspects. Your identity and your purpose. Your identity is about who you are. And your purpose is why you exist. Why are you at Manila Center Church and not in any other church? Have you ever thought of that? Why are you a woman and not a man? Why are you a man and not a woman? Why, why are you a deacon and not an elder? Why do you live in that barangay and not in another one? Why are you in Manila and not in Cebu? Why is this lady your wife and not another one? Why is this man your husband and not another person? Why? That's the big question. When we answer the why, it makes the whole difference. You see, like that black American singer, we can sing through right notes correctly that like they did the first time. Take the right note and plan the best Sabbath school program for the year. But if the why is not inside, it will be routine as usual. And the end of routine is always unfulfillment sometimes it ends in disgust now this is where it gets interesting and challenging there was a man called Abraham I believe that's my personal belief that before God came in Abraham's life Abraham was clumsy in one way or the other. At least I can say that because of his childlessness, he wasn't fulfilled. You remember? Abraham has had no children. And in his culture, having no children was not good. He was rich. 
He had money, possessions, servants, but that thing that he needed, a child, he didn't have. And he was old already. So something happens. I believe that somehow Abraham was a worshiper of God. Though he lived in a pagan nation, somehow Abraham worshipped God. But in his worship of God, he still felt clumsy. In our worship, in our service to God, sometimes we feel the same way, don't we? We do the things of God, but somewhere we don't feel fulfilled. Then God came into play and said, Hey, Abraham, go. I will show you a land. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. Pastor, I don't know if I should get excited now. Do you know why? Abraham is sitting, living, working, thinking about himself as a failure. I don't have a child. Have you lived with somebody who is childless or somebody who has children but who is rich and doesn't know whether he can trust his wealth to his children? I have seen, they are stressed. I know people who are millionaires. They look at their child. The child is useless. And they hurt every day. They are scared to put the child in the trust or in the will. It is very stressful. And sometimes you can feel like, wow, I have messed up. I have missed my life. How can I build all this up to leave it to this useless child? And Abraham had no child. It came a point where even God came and he told God, Hey God, you promised, but I don't have any child. And the, other, the, only, the only child I have is Eliezer. That's my heir. He's not my blood. So Abraham is having these negative thoughts and fears and sense of inadequateness. What he's thinking about himself. Then God comes into play and he says something like this. Hey Abraham you are great somebody should say amen here amen. you see church dear leaders it is not about what you think about yourself it's about what god thinks about you i want to say amen the more you see abraham is there feeling inadequate and God comes he's saying I don't care whether you have a child or not I don't care what you've gone through I don't care all the things that you've gone through in your life as for me God what I see in you is that you will be great and that's what God does and from that point though Abraham still had a long way to learn and understand this that was the beginning point of the end of his clumsiness. The only way our clumsiness can end is when God steps in our lives and he tells us what he thinks we are. He does it all the time. Do you want to talk about Gideon? Who was working and God came to Gideon and he said, Hey, you are a mighty man of valor. And you're going to deliver Israel. Gideon says, me? I am the least of the least. That's what I think about myself. God says, hey, Gideon, I don't care what you think about yourself. What I care about is that you think about what I think about you. He does it all the time. He went to Mary, the virgin. You will have a baby. He is going to save the world. Who am I? I'm nobody. Hey, Mary, I don't care what you think about yourself. What I care about is what I, God, think about you. Talk about Moses, the old man. I am dying, Psalm 90. I have messed up. My life is wasted. I am inadequate. I don't belong. God tells him, you are going to set Israel free from Egypt. 
So as we begin this, I want you to remember that our identity and purpose are determined, revealed, guaranteed, and accomplished by God. When we receive our identity, that is who God thinks we are and why he thinks we exist, when he tells us, that is the beginning of the end of our clumsiness. In other words, though people sat in a nominating committee, I believe they prayed. I still believe, I still believe, Lord, that in at least at Manila Central Church, the church, the committee, nominating committee is prayerful. And that when they prayed, they chose and they, said, they suggested a name. And that was somebody's name who is listening to me for any position. And God is telling you, you are going to contribute to my kingdom. That person should not sit down and say, I am odd. I don't belong. I am young. I am old. I am childless. I am this. I am that. I didn't study. I don't. That's not what God is interested in. In. What God is interested in is his word on your life. That's all. And this is what he says. You are a chosen generation. Amen? <laughs> a royal priesthood, a holy nation his own special people so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2 9. I have to look at this. I have colored two groups of words. You are so that <laughs> you are are we listening? so that you are identity so that your purpose I am because so I'm asking you now who are you many times if you who are you will give our name our lineage my father my mother my grandfather will list a lot list of things but you know God is not interested in that he's telling you you are special you are holy you are royal and I, I don't know how to explain this more for a purpose for his purpose so now I want to to read this with me let's read if I'm asking you who are you? Your answer is, I am a child of God and I exist to love him wholeheartedly and to serve him and his creation unreservedly. Now, this is what you said. I want you now to say it with the sense of why. Talk to your neighbor and read this to your neighbor. I'm asking you now, church, who are you? Talk to your neighbor. Now this doesn't end there. I have one second point. The first point is established. The moment I know who I am, no, let me say it differently. The moment God tells me who he thinks I am, the moment he tells me why I exist, that should take a personal meaning. A what? What do you mean, Pastor? You shall love the Lord your God with all your puso. Some say cussing, cussing. In English, we say your heart, your soul, everything. You see, God wants us all, He wants everything. There is no part of us that God is not interested in. He wants everything. We love him wholeheartedly. I am a child of God and I exist to love him completely. Then 
Elijah asked, how long, how long, how do you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. If you want to serve God, serve him. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Now, this is still very much hanging in the air. It's very nice truth, but what does that mean, Lord? Well, Mrs. White says that without Christ's aid, there is always incompleteness and imperfection. What this means is that anytime I feel odd, I feel unfulfilled, I feel clumsy inside out, it means that somewhere Christ is not. When I am odd, it's a symptom that Christ is not there. Hebrews 11. How many of you know Hebrews 11? What is in there? I call it the Hall of Faith. You see, this is the summary of the chapter. On the first column you have the verses and then the second one same thing the third and the fourth now this is what happens and i want you to follow me because this is the second point i'm going to share with you tonight when you read hebrews 11 this is what you see by faith abel offered a more excellent sacrifice by faith Enoch was translated by faith this person did that by faith A did B they all had the same faith but the experience of faith was different because they were different from each other. Let me say it differently. You are unique. No one is like you. And God knows that. There's a Nigerian song which says, no one be like you. There is nobody like you, therefore, there can be no experience of Christ like yours. There can be no service in Christ like yours. The reason I'm saying this is that so many times, and I am also guilty of that, we have taught the people in the church something like this. If you obey to, in Christ, God will do to you what he did to Daniel, what he did to David, what he did to Joseph, what he did to Moses. That's not true. By the way, did David enter the lion's den? Have you read it somewhere like that? Who was in the lion's den? Did Daniel kill Goliath? They have their own experience. So as a Sabbath school superintendent, as a church elder, as a deacon, you are unique. Nobody can be you, therefore, nobody can work like you. And this, the leadership of the church must understand. Sometimes we are so selfish even in our service. We are so self-centered and so inadequate. We imitate others blindly without even understanding why they did this. And we, 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 we put ourselves in a jail and we serve God like in a jail. You can do this, you can do that, you can do this, you can do that. And there is nothing new, no innovation, nothing impressive. We do the same routine all the time. You are unique. Let God use you as you are. So you can contribute and find that sense of fulfillment that he wants to give you. Our connection with our divinely appointed identity and purpose marks our entrance into the realm of what I called differentiated similarity. These people are different, though they have the same faith. The faith is the same, but the service is different. 
Don't try to copy. I'm not saying throw away what the other people did. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, what will your contribution be if ever they have to add one sentence or one verse in Hebrews 11 and put your name in? What will the Holy Spirit want to be written there? And that's yours to discover. I'm ending with this parable of the sower. Remember the first picture. Call to serve that plant and the environment. A sower went to sow, said Jesus, and this is a summary of the parable, but I want you to take note of something. You see, this section is the three unproductive soils. You remember the parable? Soil number one, by the way, side. Satan took the word, the seed. The sower went to sow a seed. When the seed fell upon the stony places, tribulation, temptation, persecution, and the seed was crushed. Among thorns, cares of this life, riches and pleasures of this life, there was no fruit. Into the good ground, there was growth and fruitfulness. If you take note of these three, Satan, tribulation, temptation, persecution, cares, riches and pleasures of the life, these things are things we don't normally control. They influence us from the outside, from our environment. There are things happening within us that makes us clumsy. And there are things happening around us that make us clumsy. But this is one thing I learned from this parable. No matter the quality of the seed, if the soil is spoiled, there will be no growth and therefore no fruit. There was no problem in the seed. The seed was perfect. There was no problem in the sower. The sower was perfect. Where was the problem? The soil. And that soil represents our hearts. When God puts his word or plants his word in our hearts, we have the choice to let it grow or die like I'm talking now. Now, I want you to see the power of the environment. You can be a good Sabbath school leader, a good church elder, if the church environment is not conducive. What do you think will happen to you? You can be the most gifted pastor, if the field is not conducive, what do you think will happen? If you can even be the most wonderful spouse, the, most, the best wife in the world, if the home environment is not conducive, what do you think will happen? So my exhortation is to be not like this lady, you are talking about clumsiness, she's saying, I am not clumsy. You are not? But we see you falling everywhere. The floor just hates me. The tables and chairs are bullies and the walls get in my way. In other words, I am not clumsy. It's not my fault. It's your fault. If I'm not a good church elder, it's because of the pastor. If I'm not a good deacon, it's because of the pastor. If I'm not this, it's because of that. Oh, I'm not a good Christian because my wife is not a good Christian because my husband, my children, in my office, my school, my teachers, all these kinds of reasons. What God wants us to say tonight is, Lord, I am clumsy because I am clumsy and I need help. I cannot be a leader in this church without your help. I need you to tell me what you want me to do for this church. 
I need you to tell me specifically. You spoke to Abraham, you spoke to Isaac, you spoke to Jacob, you spoke to Daniel, you spoke to Mary. I want my own share. I want to know what you expect from me. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and therein he meditates day and night. This verse, if you read the third verse, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers, bearing fruit. But there are two things in this. Before the fruit comes out, <laughs> blessed is the man or the woman who walks not, stands not, sits not with bad people. Blessed, Lord help me. Blessed is the church leader who gets rid of any person that is not helping him or her in serving God. Blessed is the leader who clears his or her environment. But his delight. What is the word for delight in Tagalog? Saya. Saya. Let that word, you know. You know what it means? You, you feel good. You like it. You delight in the law of God and you meditate. That is within. Something within you is clear. So you are clean inside and you are clean outside. Then you can bear fruit. Then you can be the super summer school superintendent that God wants you to be. Then you can be that wonderful leader, that deacon, whatever office God has given you. Then you will bear fruit in the church and in the life of the people. So what this means is this, pastor, some of us tonight, we have to decide to stop that relationship that does not give glory to God. Not only stop, go and tell the person, I like you very much. But this thing is not helping me in my service to God. So I will not continue. I want, us to, I want to cut ties. Some of us, I wish we could have room inspection tonight. We go back to Manila in our various bedrooms and we see how the room looks. How did we leave our rooms today? It tells us how clumsy we are. Some of us must now learn how to take care of our bedrooms. We leave the bed in the morning very neat. It is part of growing and becoming a good leader. How dare I think that I will take care of God's children if I can't take care of my bedroom? Some of us need to take all those magazines that are under our beds. We go and burn them. Am I making sense? We need to clear the environment. We need to clear the inside so that God can come in to play and be comfortable. And that cleaning is not our doing. It is God's doing again. We need to be ready to be attentive to God's desire. That's what he's saying. Be ready to clear everything. And someone tonight as I close this message is thinking, God, I know I have to get rid of this, but I can't because I like it. But I want you to help me get rid of that thing so I can serve you, so I can hear you, so I can grow in you, so I can bless others, so I can be what you want me to be, so I can know what you think about me, so I stop thinking about myself as a failure, as an odd person, as somebody who doesn't fit, who doesn't belong, who is unprepared, unqualified, so that I trust you, my God, that you will help me be what you want me to be and do what you want me to do by your grace. If this is your prayer, I want you to close your eyes, bow your head,
as we pray.